Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Andrew Fay. Um, as Victoria said, I'm hoping to be able to speak to you from both sides of the fence today. So from my 12 years experience in working in the freelancer accountancy industry and also actually sitting where you are now as a freelancer running my own business. So what, we, what we've been asked to talk about today is different ways to structure your business as a freelancer. So there are numerous ways we can structure a business as a freelancer. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time now looking at the different options and the, some of the advantages and some of the responsibilities associated to each one. The first option I want to talk about is working by an umbrella company on a PAYE basis. And what, what it means working as an umbrella company is when you join an umbrella company, you'll become an employee of that company. Any work that you complete as a freelancer, the umbrella company will invoice on your behalf and those funds are paid directly to the umbrella company. They then take off the associated tax and national insurance for you and take care of all that with the revenue and the rest of that, those funds are paid to you as a salary. So the benefits of an umbrella company is really low hassle, it's low administration, really good if you're just considering starting out as a freelancer or just dipping your toe in, your, in the water maybe as a part-time basis. There's, there's a theme that will go through this presentation which is as the level of responsibility and administration and ownership increases through the different models, so do the associated tax benefits with those models. So working as an umbrella, through an umbrella company, because it's a, on a pay-as-you-earn basis, there isn't necessarily the associated tax benefits you would hope to get. So a big driver, really, for people, or one of the main drivers when people become a freelancer is to actually take advantage of the, the tax benefits of working in that way. So although the umbrella option is a simple and, and a low hassle solution, the tax benefits aren't really there as much. The second option I want to talk about is a sole trader. Uh, just out of interest, how many people here are a sole trader today? How many people operate as a limited company? And how many people don't really know and are here to, to look at understanding it? Okay, that's quite, a, quite an interesting mix then. So as a sole trader then, being a sole trader, as probably half of the room know, um, basically means you register with the inline revenue as a self-employed individual. You then invoice for the work that you complete. When you receive those funds, those funds are subject to income tax. Now there is a tax benefit compared to the umbrella option that we talked about, which is associated to the national insurance. But as I said earlier on, as the tax benefits increase, so, do the, so does the relevant administration. So working as a sole trader, you're required to keep a detailed um, log of your income and expenditure, and you're also required to complete a self-assessment tax return. Now, one of the important things to consider when being a sole trader is you're not protected by any form of limited liability protection. So if anything was to go wrong with a piece of work that you were working on and a client looked to, to claw back damages, you could be personally liable from those creditors. Okay, so we can now see the financial benefits are increasing slightly, but so is the administration and the ownership. The third option I want to talk about is a, a limited company. So usually operating through a limited company, you will be a director and a shareholder of that limited company. Now being a shareholder of a limited company means you can extract some or all of the income out of that limited company as a dividend. And dividends are subject to corporation tax, not income tax. And currently that's at a lower level than income tax. So the financial benefits associated working with a limited company are a lot higher. Now again, following that trend, as the financial benefits increase, so does the administration. So being a director of a limited company is a serious responsibility. And you'll have to ensure that that company complies with the Companies Law Act. And that company will need to submit a full set of financial accounts every year. So you really now need to start engaging with an accountant at this level and have the correct controls and structure. What the limited company does give you is a limited liability protection. So as opposed to the sole trader <coughs> option that we talked about before where you're personally liable, the li within the limited liability protection, that business is liable. Okay, so there's quite a high level overview, I appreciate, but just to give you a flavour of the different ways of working, some of the advantages and some of the, the overheads associated with those ways of working. So as well as considering the financial and the, the sort of commercial elements of that, you also need to think about you as an individual. So why did you become a freelancer in the first place? What's your attitude to risk? All these, your personal preferences need to be factored into the decision around how you want to run your business. 
And because of the amount of information that needs to be considered within this decision, what I'm really recommending today is we need to get some professional advice on this. Sit down with somebody and speak to them around what actually are the financial incentives. Take some figures that are specific to you and run them through each of those models. And with it, then once you've done that, consider the corporate responsibilities. And within those corporate responsibilities, what's your attitude to that risk? Do you want to take that on? Did you get into freelancing because it was a lifestyle choice? Or because actually I'm growing a business? So <clears throat> again, one of the things from a personal point of view, when I was working as a freelancer, it, it's a tough job really. You've got to, you're the, the owner of the business, you've got to find the business, then you've got to complete the work. And when you've completed the work, you've got to invoice for all that money and then chase that money down as well. The last thing that you really want to be doing is increasing your overheads. You didn't become a freelancer to be an accountant and start looking at all the bookkeeping and performing the accounts. Because of this, get professional help, get advice, look for a professional service provider that can, that can help you with this. So once we're happy with our business and we've sorted it and we understand what our risks are and we've been to the accountants and we, we know what our model looks like, we then need to consider our employment status. And what this means is just because we're a freelancer and we're working on our own right and we no longer operate under an employment contract, doesn't mean that the revenue can't perceive us as what's called a, as a disguised employee in their terms. The two bits of legislation really which are topical to this and they are IR35 and IR56. I'm not going to go through in a great amount of detail into the legislation. What The point I want to make is that there are a series of tests that the revenue will look at on your employment status. These cover your contract, your working practices, and it's much broader than just saying I'm a freelancer, I'm self-employed. And again, what I'm trying to say is that once we've made this lifestyle choice, once we've decided to be a freelancer, we need to now start looking at our employment status and understanding what the risks are associated to them. So if you're working on a contract which the revenue deemed to be caught by IR35, the revenue will seek to claw back penalties um, and the, the gap in tax from the pays you earn equivalent to those. And that's to you as the business, uh, as the individual. Once they've done that, they may also then go to your client, which is your customer, which you fought very hard to get through all the, the good skills we've learned through some of the other presentations today, and say, well, because this individual here was a disguised employee, you also now, you owe us the employer contributions. So it's, it, it's a big risk again, and so this follows a, a general point which I'm trying to make, which is we need to make sure we, we look at for a specialist accountant, somebody who understands freelancers, who understands the freelancing industry. What I wanted to put this slide up for is that throughout the different ways of working, obviously there are financial differences. I'm not going to go through each one of these individual individually but what I wanted to show is obviously as the level of administration and overheads and responsibilities increase throughout the model you can see the knock-on impact to your financial take-home. As you can see there though this, these calculations assume £5,000 of expenses have been claimed and that the businesses are members of the flat rate VAT scheme as well. What I would like to say is myself and other members of Brooks and are here throughout the day. So if anybody has any specific questions about the type of business that they're running at the moment or their individual financial circumstances, they're happy to offer financial consultations. This is just there as a guide to show you the differences. Okay, so what we've talked about is the different ways to structure the business. Once we've structured the business, the impacts of understanding our employment status, and because of all the factors that are involved in both of these, our advice today is make sure you choose a specialist accountant. But once you've got that specialist accountant, make sure they've got a wide range of services. Again, as I said earlier, being a freelancer, there's enough to take on without taking on these financial responsibilities yourself. Make sure you've got access to employment law specialists. Make sure you're getting your employment status checked on regular intervals and make sure it's done by somebody who understands the industry. Outsource as many tasks as you can. And in addition to that as well, you also want your accountant to do what an accountant should do. Make sure you're maximising your income. Make sure that your expenses 
<coughs> are correct. Make sure you're enumerating yourself in the most efficient way and make sure that you have access to relevant tax planning services. Okay, so just to summarise, freelancing is a rewarding way of working. I don't want to lose sight of that now. The accountant's had his view and been able to say, oh, there's lots of scary things we need to consider. Um, but there are a, a wide range of complex issues we need to consider. And because they are complex, we need to make sure that we engage with specialists on these and appoint providers who remove as much hassle as possible from you rather than you taking that hassle on as well as being a freelancer. Okay, thank you very much for your time.